I'm Lynn Markham. I'm the training and events coordinator for the uh, library. And we apologize that, or the dean would ask me to say she sends her apologies. But you would not really want her here because she is sick. And she looks really sick yesterday when she came in. So she's really sorry she's not here to introduce our speakers and, and to be here for this presentation. So I am going to just turn it over. This is Nick Shockey and Nicole Allen. And they're with Spark, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. And they're going to be doing the presentation. I'm going to let them tell you a bit about themselves. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Yeah, happy to, uh, to be here. We're on a little Texas tour. We're in Austin uh, on Tuesday at the um, University of Texas, as well as at the Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, then yesterday, at, uh, well, I was at UNT and uh, uh, University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, Nicole was actually in California for the day because uh, we received a last minute invitation to join a small roundtable discussion with uh, Jill Biden. Um, so Nicole was up that yesterday, uh, here today, and then at UT San Antonio tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, So it's great to be able to stop uh, by Lubbock on our Texas tour and be here at uh, Texas Tech. Um, just to give you a little background on uh, Spark, our organization. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware of Spark, we are uh, a library membership organization of uh, more than 200 academic and research libraries across. Uh, mainly uh, the U.S. and Canada, but we have international members from around the world and international affiliate organizations in Europe, Africa, uh, and Japan. And essentially what we do is uh, try to work on opening up access to the research literature, the data that underlies the research literature, uh, and uh, educational materials as well. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about sort of opening up access to research, the challenges that um, you know, researchers and anybody trying to get access to the research literature face. And, uh, Talk a bit about open access as the solution. My colleague Nicole will talk uh, similarly about uh, the challenge of getting access to educational resources uh, and some of the solutions there. And then we'll offer a few suggestions of um, you know uh, policies or actions that Texas Tech might consider to uh, sort of move the ball forward uh, on these issues. Um, I also want to note at the top that our presentation is openly licensed um, and actually already online. Um, so if you go to bit.ly uh, forward slash TX tech, uh, open, you can actually download uh, the full slide deck right now. So if you see any slides uh, that are interesting or you want to sort of reuse or repurpose them, uh, they're all online for you to use. Or if you want to follow some of the citations for the data that's in the presentation, uh, that's you know in very small text at the bottom of the slide or in the, the notes. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, you know, the challenges of getting access to the research literature and how that's tied uh, to cost uh, for the librarians. I know this is probably uh, information that you're already uh, aware of, but I hope um, some of the, the figures here might be useful um, in sort of how to frame uh, the conversation uh, with faculty and some talking points. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about open access and I'll hand it off to, to Nicole. Uh, so, just to dive right in uh, on the, the journals portion, whenever I talk to faculty on campuses about you know, how they get access to research articles, uh, oftentimes I get some variation of this quote that you know, eventually it's generally possible to get access to most articles uh, if you try uh, hard enough, if you, you know, bother a colleague in another institution, if you don't have access to it, if you can go around for it, um, you know, if you go look on ResearchGate or academia.edu, um, you know, if you hunt hard enough, you can generally find a copy somewhere. Uh, I think you know we've gotten really used to, uh, to workarounds and trying to get access to articles when you know they're not available in the library's uh, collections. And some of these workarounds uh, are quite interesting. Uh, one of my personal favorites is through Twitter. Uh, there's actually a Twitter hashtag called uh, I can has PDF, uh, where you can tweet a link of an article that you're looking for, and other folks monitor uh, this hashtag and will send you. Uh, a copy of that article, uh, though important to note that uh, in many cases this is uh, probably violating copyright law, um, since you know you only have access to uh, you know an article that's under full copyright uh, in your institution, it would be a violation to send it to somebody else. But people still um, still do it. There's another example I mentioned uh, that sort of wins points for irony, um, which is there's uh, a big scholarly society, AAAS, that uh, hosts. Uh, an awesome program in DC where they take newly minted PhD, uh, uh, PhDs uh, and bring them into government in DC. That, you know, they work with science advisors on the Hill and federal agencies. 
Uh, but the issue is, since they have you know, now graduated with their PhD, they're no longer at their institution, and they no longer have their library card. Um, so when they get to DC to put you know, that training to use, they lose access to all the research literature um, you know, that they depend on to stay current in their field or to try to translate that information to the federal government. Uh, and so as part of this fellowship program, AAA has set up uh, an email list for the fellows you know, so they can arrange happy hours and these things. Uh, but I also know that there are emails to go around on the list where people are asking for access uh, to articles. Uh, and I'm still waiting to see if somebody asks for uh, a science article, that would just be uh, perfect. But that, I think it's just another example of sort of the workarounds that, um, that we've, we've gotten used to. And I think a large part of the reason uh, for that, and again, a familiar one for the librarians in the room, uh, is that journals can be very expensive. Uh, so, um, I guess, take a guess in your head uh, what you think the average uh, price for an ISI indexed health sciences journal, the number. The average, though not most expensive, uh, it's about $1,800. Uh, most recently, this is from the Library Journal's periodical pricing survey. Uh, it's about $1,800 a year on average for a health sciences journal that's indexed by uh, ISI. Uh, not all disciplines are uh, this expensive or this cheap, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, education, for example, uh, is only seven or $978 um, on average. Uh, per year, but if you look at the trend in the price of education journals specifically, uh, they've increased about 14% just since 2014, and that's fairly common. Um, so you can see next year we're on track to you know, easily blow past the $1,000 uh, mark again on, on average. And it turns out there are uh, more than 15 entire academic disciplines uh, where the average ISI index journal uh, price is above $1,000 per subscription per year for an institutional. Uh, subscriptions, you can see chemistry is by far the most expensive at more than $5,000 uh, per year. Uh, and then the, the survey also said the average uh, across all of these disciplines was just shy of $1,800. Uh, should also say if you ever have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I hate talking to people, so yeah, we can sort of have a two-way conversation at any point. I would definitely, definitely welcome that. Um, and so when journal prices are this high, means libraries have to spend a lot, lot more money subscribing to these journals even just to maintain the same level of access, or in many cases actually have a lower level of access, but yet are spending uh, much, much more. So this is data from the Association of Research Libraries, essentially showing that uh, libraries uh, are spending more than 400% more on journal subscriptions um, since 1986. And this is the most recent graph uh, that ARLs produce. Uh, it only goes through 2010. Uh, I have colleagues at ARL, though, that are working on the update to this, uh, and I believe um, once it has the most recent data, that will be closer to uh, more than 500% increase. Um, so it's just gone up uh, and up and up. So this means that uh, you know, libraries now are just spending eye-watering uh, amounts of money on journal subscriptions. Uh, collectively, uh, all U.S. academic libraries spend uh, just shy of $2.2 billion a year on journal subscriptions. Um, when you translate that down to uh, individual libraries, that means on, a, on average across all uh, higher ed institutions, um, libraries are spending a little bit more than $700,000 per year. But if you look at research libraries and uh, members of the Association of Research Libraries specifically, uh, on average, they're spending uh, a little bit more than $9 million a year uh, on, on access. Um, and I think you know, one of the reasons the price of these journals has increased so rapidly uh, you know, again, about two to three times above, uh, two to three times above inflation year in and year out uh, for decades is that uh, academic publishing has become dominated by a handful of commercial uh, publishers that actually turn out to be some of the most profitable companies uh, in the world. So this is a graph uh, comparing the profit margins of two of the larger, or really the largest uh, commercial publishers, Springer and Elsevier, uh, against what you might think of as uh, sort of fairly profitable companies. Um, so you can see these two academic journal publishers uh, and their you know, journal publishing arms are more profitable, uh, at least in 2014, um, you know, than Pfizer, than Google, than ExxonMobil, uh, than Apple, than Disney, than McDonald's. Um, and actually, uh, now it's not just libraries that are starting to notice this, but sort of the, the wider world from just a couple of years ago, The Economist actually called academic publishing, quote, a license uh, to print money, uh, which I think is really disturbing for uh, a number of reasons, and I think the reason we've sort of gotten to this place is because the way that academic publishing is set up is, and it's, you know, it's a circle of gifts uh, economy, right? Researchers sign away their copyright for free, oftentimes without even looking at the copyright transfer 
uh, agreement in some cases. You know, you do peer review uh, for free in most cases. Uh, you know, oftentimes serve on the editorial boards uh, of journals, uh, either for free or for you know very little compensation. Um, so you know, a huge portion of the the inputs in the business system are uh, voluntarily uh, given, and then on the other side, uh, represented by uh, the monopoly man. Uh, every article is in a very real sense its own monopoly, right? Academic journals aren't like newspapers where, you know, if the New York Times is too expensive, you can subscribe to the Washington Post or the LA Times. Um, you know, if you're trying to get access to information that's published in science, uh, you can't get that anywhere else. You can't, you know, go to Nature or PNAS or SAL um, to get that information. You have to get it in that, that journal. And so that, you know, gives commercial publishers a tremendous amount of power to, to set the price because libraries have to pay whatever the commercial publishers are asking in order to provide legal access uh, on, on their campus. Um, and just to sort of close up the access problem, um, the access problem is not a technical one. It's a cultural one. And I think one of the, the examples that really um, sort of has hit this point home in just the last couple of years is SciHub, uh, which many of you are probably familiar. Uh, for those of you that aren't, SciHub is an illegal uh, art or a legal file sharing website uh, for peer-reviewed research articles. Uh, it has a database of, uh, I think, more than 40, I think it might be up to 50 million uh, research articles uh, that are in you know, a, a database that is maintained uh, uh, you know, outside of uh, sort of US jurisdiction. Uh, and there's a, an article earlier this year in Science uh, on SciHub uh, with the title, Who's Downloading Pirated Papers? Everyone. Um, and so I have to see a tremendous uh, amount of usage, and there are up to well over 6 million users every month. Uh, it turns out uh, there are a number of users actually here in Lubbock. Uh, I looked, uh, you can dig down uh, in the, uh, the SciHub article in Science and see they took six months of the server logs uh, from SciHub and tracked where the hits are coming from. Uh, just searching Lubbock County, there are uh, just shy of 1,800 downloads uh, across the six months of logs that were there. And actually, this isn't that uncommon. Uh, some of the highest sci-hub usage um, is, are at uh, locations that are sort of co-located with really large research institutions that spend millions of dollars uh, for journal access. Um, you know, who knows why researchers are using sci-hub instead of, uh, you know, library collections, but it, it certainly seems um, to be happening. I think, you know, some of it's, you know, getting access to articles that they didn't have access to the library. Uh, I know in other cases it might be more convenient, they can't get their VPN to work, or they don't have off-site access, and so go through, uh, through SciHub. But I think the most important sort of lesson uh, that I think SciHub teaches is that um, this, this, again, is, is not a technical problem. SciHub was set up by a 22-year-old graduate student from Kazakhstan, uh, and she created this database that serves, that will you know, give you essentially any article that's ever been published to anybody in the world with an internet connection set up by a 22 year old. Um, and that's doing, you know, arguably a better job of distributing uh, the research literature, um, you know, than our legacy mechanisms in terms of, you know, getting access to people. It's illegal. Um, you know, there's a huge question that's not, you know, a sustainable model for doing this, but I think it shows uh, how much of this problem is a cultural one, not a technical barrier. Um, and so, uh, that's why we advocate for, and you know, libraries are really starting to push uh, open access to research articles as uh, a solution. We think this is sort of the sustainable um, solution to um, the access problem uh, that we think, you know, SciHub is sort of um, more a symptom of the brokenness of the system rather than the solution uh, to that brokenness. And so we have a fairly specific uh, definition of open access that has two parts. It's free immediate online access to the peer-reviewed research literature. Uh, with full reuse, right? So it's not just getting access to a flat PDF, um, you know, that might still be under full copyright, uh, but that there's an open license uh, on those research articles so that um, they can be bulk downloaded uh, so that researchers can perform text and data mining analysis, um, you know, so that you can, you know, download a local copy of the article to, you know, an institutional repository so you have it to go locally and can archive it, you know, so that you can share a copy with anybody else in the world. Uh, that's why that, that second part of the reuse rights uh, is so important. There are sort of two paths uh, to uh, moving towards an open access system. Uh, the first is simply publishing in open access journals that make all of their articles uh, freely and immediately available online under an open license. Uh, and then the second path, and one that I think uh, probably more faculty can take more immediately, is what's called self-archiving, essentially making a copy 
uh, of the manuscript of an article uh, accessible even if the final sort of version of record is behind a paywall. Um, so we've seen a huge amount of growth uh, in open access journals. There are now more than 9,000 uh, peer-reviewed open access journals in publication. Um, that's I think, nearly tripled in the last uh, six to seven years, so we see you know, tremendous growth. Uh, here you're probably already familiar with many open access journals like Ones for Paws by Central. Uh, there's uh, increasing efforts in the social sciences and humanities, uh, like the Open Library of the Humanities, to serve uh, those, those disciplines. And there's a great resource called the Directory of Open Access Journals at doha.org, uh, where you can find uh, journals in your discipline that might be uh, the ones that you might consider publishing in. There are also an ever-increasing uh, number of open access repositories uh, around the world. Those range from institutional uh, repositories to uh, discipline-specific repositories like PubMed Central that's run by the NIH, uh, or uh, Archive, which is run out of Cornell for the Physics, uh, and now other communities. Um, did you, excuse me, did you leave the SSRN out there on purpose? Uh, no, I, I didn't have it on there before, just because, I guess, we're big fans of Clement Central and Archives, sort of like the mother repository, you know, from uh, the role that it's played there. Uh, but yes, uh, it's a good point. So for uh, those of you that are familiar, uh, SSRN, uh, some repository serving the social sciences um, community that um, was recently purchased by a commercial publisher earlier this year, and now there is a lot of concern over the future uh, of, uh, of that portal. Um, but there's now Social Archive, uh, which is uh, the sort of nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit uh, archive for at least the sociology community. Um, and there's been sort of a uh, a lot of new discipline-specific uh, repositories that are coming online, like Social Archive, like BioArchive. You might sense a theme here. Uh, there's an engineering one that has the same uh, sort of uh, flow to it. It's inner, inner archive or something like this. Uh, Anyway, so we've seen an explosion in the number of discipline-specific repositories, um, and you know these are uh, managed uh, sort of by researchers uh, and you know within the academy. Um, so I think not really as nearly as much risk as others for being sort of uh, absorbed by large commercial uh, companies. Um, you know, in that that case actually speaks to some of the the. The danger in having such profitable commercial publishers, Elsevier, uh, the new owner of SSRN, um, cleared more than a billion dollars in profit alone uh, last year. And so they have a lot of cash to invest in buying up these types of uh, pieces of infrastructure, which have been very uh, concerning. Um, so I know that you know, people that used to be big fans of SSRN are not looking for alternatives. Uh, I'm unsure what the future of that will be. The other thing that's really important to know uh, around this, uh, the self archiving path. Uh, is that uh, majority of publishers, more than 70%, uh, allow faculty, uh, allow authors to make some form uh, of the manuscript uh, freely accessible online, even if it's you know, published in a subscription-based journal. And so, you know, for a large portion of the research literature, you, you know, uh, oftentimes already have the rights that you need to make a copy of the manuscript available through uh, an institutional archive. It's just about exercising uh, those rights. And, uh, one of the important things to sort of know um, when encouraging folks to exercise the rights that they do have is that uh, there's an increasing uh, body of evidence showing a strong correlation between making uh, an article or the manuscript of an article publicly or openly accessible and a significant increase in views and downloads and ultimately in citations. Uh, so this is a graph uh, from an article that came out uh, earlier this year in F1000, um, that's a summary of what's called the citation advantage, uh, open access citation advantage across uh, many other disciplines. So it's probably a little bit small uh, to see, though, until on the slide you can see that the detail a little bit better, but essentially uh, uh, it's showing across all these different fields uh, how many more citations uh, articles that are openly or publicly accessible get uh, than the articles that are only uh, available uh, behind a paywall. Uh, and so you can see. The citation advantage can be pretty significant. I mean, even you know, 25 or 30 percent bump in citations, uh, you know, would be I think, tremendously beneficial. That's something that I think most people will be really, really happy about. Uh, but you can see in many disciplines, um, you know, the increase in citation, um, you know, is two, three, or maybe even four or five times uh, the rate of closed articles. Yes. How did that graph handle a publisher like Highwire? It would, where, for, 
in which, uh, after the manuscript is accepted, it's the PDF of the manuscript file is openly available until the manuscript goes into print, and then for 12 months, there's a paid access, and then after 12 months, it's again open access. Yes. How does that fit on that graph? So this graph is actually a meta-analysis of all of the individual studies that have been done on this subject. Um, so if you go to, uh, there's the DOIs and the, uh, the citation and uh, the presentation. If you go to this article, um, it will show you all the different studies that are represented by these dots. So how do, how do those studies handle, again, a publisher like Highwire that it's open access, closed fee-for-service, and then open access? Each of the studies is, is different. Um, you know, so some of them are only looking at open access articles versus closed in a journal, or some uh, some have treatments where they, uh, I think, worked with publishers to open some articles but not others, and did that in a random way. Um, and then I think others were looking at you know those that were made available like after uh, an embargo period, and so they really run the gamut. There's you know it's a fairly heterogeneous um, sort of research methodologies across all of those articles. Um, but like I said, if you go there, you can click through to see the individual studies that are represented by the dots and see, um, you know, which research methodologies that they use. Um, and I think there have been close to, I want to say 70 um, studies that have now been done on the, the citation advantage, and I would say, I want to say about 48 uh, to 50 of those have shown a fairly strong correlation between the two, um, so pretty, pretty solid body of evidence. Um, just to give you an idea of how this translates on the ground, and these are anecdotes, so uh, you know your mileage may vary. Uh, but the uh, vice uh, chancellor of the Queensland University of Technology um, speaks on this topic quite a lot because that institution was actually one of the first in the world to implement uh, an institutional policy requiring that articles publish um, there be made openly available or publicly available rather. Um, and so, um, you know, this is showing that increase in citation rate for one particular faculty member um, starting, you know, I guess from way back in the late 90s, they, you know, put into place their institutional open access policy uh, around 2006, 2005, 2006. And then you can see the, the increase, similar, you know, same graph for another faculty member. Obviously, there are other factors that go into this, right, over time, your stature and your you know, academic community is likely to increase. There are lots of other reasons, you know, citation counts increase over time, uh, you know, but I think, you know, the graphs are uh, fairly dramatic and held for, you know, quite a few faculty members. And, you know, looking at all the studies that I mentioned, you know, it does seem like, you know, at least part of this is the fact that more people are, you know, have access to it, more people can read it, and then in turn, uh, more folks end up uh, citing. Uh, so this is, you know, good for individual researchers, but I think it's also, important uh, to think about this at the institutional level, right? This is more visibility for uh, the research output of the institution that raises the visibility of you know, that institution as uh, you know one that is a leading research institution. So I think there are benefits not only for individual faculty members, but also for um, the institution itself. So looking, uh, sort of turning towards uh, policy before I hand things over to uh, to Nicole, there are a lot of efforts underway to, uh, to move towards making uh, you know, our, our, re our system for communicating research results uh, open uh, by default. Uh, as I already referenced in passing, there are uh, a tremendous number now of institutional policies uh, that, that require uh, that articles, or at least text of articles, be made publicly accessible. Uh, in the U.S., all of these uh, policies you know, have been passed by faculty senates, so it's you know faculty putting these policies in place themselves, uh, not you know, sort of handed down uh, by administrators. Uh, and I think a really good way to think about these policies um, is you know uh, is really a sort of collective retention uh, of rights. So instead of trying to negotiate for your rights to your article with each publisher, um, you know if you need to publish in a subscription-based journal, these policies are a way for you to say, hey, actually my institution has this policy that requires me to make a copy publicly accessible through an institutional repository. And so you have sort of the weight of the institution behind you rather than just trying to do that as an individual author. Uh, increasingly, there are uh, more than 100 research funders all around the world and more than two dozen countries uh, that are requiring that articles reporting on research they fund uh, be made uh, publicly uh, accessible. And uh, the best example of this in the U.S. is a 2013 policy that some of you might be familiar with uh, that came out of 
of the White House uh, that essentially requires that uh, any articles reporting on federally funded research in the United States uh, have to be made publicly accessible within uh, approximately 12 months of publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, the other interesting thing about this policy, and I think um, it speaks to uh, sort of the, the increasing importance of these issues uh, within the administration, within the government, is that uh, now that the Obama administration is sort of coming to uh, you know, the end of its term, uh, they're putting out you know, impact reports and sort of retrospectives on what they've done, and actually that policy that I mentioned uh, actually clocked in at number 13 out of 100 of the you know, policies they're uh, proud of as showing the administration's leadership on science, technology, and innovation issues, which I think is really sort of heartening to see the administration take it that, that seriously. Um, this is only a directive, um, which is a fairly weak uh, uh, vehicle for getting policy through, um, which is why we actually uh, now have a bill in both the House and Senate called the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act, or FASTER, uh, that would essentially codify that 2013 White House directive into law uh, to make it more durable. Because uh, right now, any future administration could overturn that policy with the stroke of a pen, um, and this would lock it in uh, to law. It also makes a couple significant improvements on the executive directive that strengthens language around reuse, uh, so it makes it easier for researchers to do uh, text and data mining analysis on sort of the full corpus of uh, federally funded research. Uh, and then, at least on the House side, it shortens the delay after which articles are made available uh, from the current 12 months down to six months. Then the Senate version got amended when it went through committee, uh, so it's 12 months in the Senate. Uh, but this bill actually moved out of committee in the Senate uh, it moved uh, on a unanimous vote through the uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs uh, Committee, which is a huge step forward. You know, the vast majority of legislation never gets a hearing, let alone uh, you know moves through a committee. And so I think it really speaks to uh, you know the interest in this issue within uh, the legislative branch. Um, and it's been really, I mean, this is I think the fifth or sixth Congress that we've introduced legislation uh, into. This is by far the farthest that. Uh, that we've got, yeah. I was gonna say, that's actually one of our two senators up there. Um, so I was gonna get to that. If Love. any of you want to, <laughs> you know, write and thank or goad or wait, whatever you call it, um, push him yeah. to push it a little harder. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely been a, uh, a big champion. I mean, he's a large part of the reason I moved through committee uh, in the Senate, but hearing from constituents uh, is certainly very, very helpful. Um, and he's you know, been a tremendous leader and positive force on getting this as far as it has, uh, has gotten. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting is, you know, we've been introducing these bills, uh, like I said, for five or six Congresses now, and you know, for the longest time, the challenge is just getting people to even care, to just like notice this as an issue they should even be thinking about. Um, you know, and there's still some of that work to be done, but now it's a political issue. Now the block's not really that people don't know about it, uh, it's that there are, uh, you know, special interests in a few districts, uh, you know, so there, you know, hold threats in the Senate. Um, but, you know, we've been working with Senator Hornet, who's the Senate Majority Whip, um, you know, to use, you know, the web operation that he has to try to, to push. Um, so he's been really, really helpful, and it's been really interesting to see this issue actually move into to that arena. So, um, you know, there's not much time left in this Congress. They're only in session for... Uh, a little bit longer before the election, but we expect they'll probably be very actively in that session after the election. Um, so it's you know very very difficult to get any standalone piece of legislation passed. Um, but you know this has already made it farther um, than than most bills. Um, so you know we'll continue pushing it as hard as we can. And, you know we'll see where we get. But even if it doesn't, this is a tremendous step forward. Um, and there are also other uh, other ways to get this text uh, passed into law. Um, those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the agony that is passing anything uh, in DC uh, these days uh, will mercifully not know uh, that how a lot of stuff gets passed now is that you know, there are a few what are generally considered must pass bills, um, like the defense authorization that didn't go through the other week. Um, anyway, but these you know, sort of must pass bills essentially become Christmas trees where everybody shoves language for everything onto because it has to get through. So there are other ways to. To, to do this, and since it's made it out of committee, that actually paves the way to, to be able to attach this to legislation that is moving more easily since it's been vetted by committee. Um, the other really exciting thing as the vice president is starting to talk about how it doesn't make any sense that our taxpayer funded research is left behind paywalls. Uh, it's become one of his talking points around his Cancer Moonshot initiative, 
Um, so he's been talking publicly uh, about how we, we need to open up taxpayer-funded research, which we're really excited about. Um, he's also talked about um, basically the same point, but through data. Um, you know, the, the Cancer Moonshot Initiative's goal is to make 10 years uh, worth of progress on cancer research in five years. Uh, and so uh, we've already seen supportive statements around these ideas. Um, you know, right now we're not aware of any concrete underlying policy proposals, but we are definitely uh, in regular communication um, with the White House and the Office of uh, the Vice President, um, you know, with the dialogue. And so, you know, we'd love to see more concrete proposals be baked in, but, you know, just hearing the Vice President talk about, you know, open access and open data, um, you know, it's really, really been tremendous. We also uh, are fairly bullish on uh, the next administration. Uh, we've had really positive meetings with actually most of the campaigns on both sides throughout um, this this cycle. Uh, we've been working on this presidential election since December 2014, um, and had you know positive meetings with a lot of the the campaigns. Um, in our uh, latest meeting with uh, the Trump campaign. Uh, you know, they seemed very open to uh, both open access as well as uh, OER, um, you know, as, uh, initiatives, you know, no, like, no promises or anything like that, but, uh, you know, they, they definitely seemed quite, quite receptive uh, to these issues. Uh, on the other side, Hillary Clinton's released, uh, you know, fairly detailed policy proposals and uh, in her uh, initiative on technology and information, um, she has language uh, essentially saying that she's, not just going to make this stuff freely available, but actually uh, openly licensed uh, for research uh, articles as well as educational materials, which is really uh, exciting to say this um, rising to that level. Uh, finally, there are also private foundations, uh, increasingly, that are requiring that results of research they fund be made publicly accessible, uh, or even openly accessible in the case of the Gates Foundation. So uh, just under two years ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, released what is the world's strongest uh, open access policy uh, that will go into full effect on January 1st of next year. Uh, that will require that any articles uh, published with their uh, their funding have to be made uh, available under a CC BY license, the most liberal uh, Creative Commons license, which my fellow people will talk about in just a second. Uh, but it has to be fully open from day one, not just publicly accessible. Um, so that's been been really great to see. Um, then finally, um, you yeah, have been working on these issues for about 10 years now, and I remember. You know, we would, I was so happy when we get like one New York Times article uh, on these issues in a year. Like, it's a great month when that happened. Now, there, this is regularly uh, in the news, and you know, some of the most high profile outlets, you know, from The Economist to The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, uh, The New York Times, uh, and others. And so, I think uh, it's a really interesting time uh, in sort of the open movements generally, the visibility on these, not just from government, but also from major media and um, you know, institutions uh, is really, really ratcheted up, I think, with the uh, federal policies that I mentioned. Um, university presidents and provosts are starting to, to pay a lot more attention because universities are ultimately the ones responsible for compliance with those policies. And so these the federal policies, I think, have given us a really good uh, opening to talk to university administrators about these issues and why, why they're important. So uh, I will pause there and turn it over to my colleague Nicole, who will tell a very similar story uh, for educational materials. Uh, so, hi everybody. Uh, points for the Spark T-shirt. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for flying the flag. Uh, oh yeah. Good try. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, my work at Spark focuses on uh, open educational resources and open education more generally. Uh, I think, you know, Spark was founded uh, over 15 years ago out of uh, addressing this issue of rising journal prices and transitioning to a more open system of scholarly communication. Um, in more recent years, uh, it's, especially as campuses have started to use more digital content in education, the library has become increasingly involved in course content. You know, traditionally it was very much, you know, students get their books at the bookstore, faculty get their own stuff and, and, and get it at the bookstore, and students get it at the bookstore. But now there's this huge opportunity uh, to work with faculty to assign alternative course content that's lower cost um, and actually use the library's innate skills and expertise to be able to help with that. So that's my role at Spark, is helping to expand our program in this area, both in terms of what happens on campus, but also in terms of practice. So I'm sure that uh, it's no surprise to any of you that the cost of textbooks is a major concern for students. So this, of course, is in the context of the overall 
rising cost of higher education. The blue line at the top is tuition and fees, um, rising 89% uh, between 2002 and 2012. Um, and college textbooks are just under that at 82%. Um, it's continued at this pace three times the rate of inflation. Uh, you know, we're, we're at a point where the average student debt in the U.S. is, is close to $30,000. And uh, you know, one, one journalist referred to uh, the current generation of students, my generation, as generation debt. And uh, you know, higher education is increasingly necessary for jobs and, and just contributing to our, the economy. And yet it's getting more and more expensive, even though we live in an age where information is abundant. And today's college students have grown up in a world where they're used to getting access to information instantly with you know, a couple of clicks on a computer. And yet textbooks and their education is becoming more and more expensive. Uh, just to put this in context, um, so this is uh, a college board chart uh, at the typical four-year uh, public institution, students are spending uh, over $1,200 a year, or students should budget over $1,200 a year for books and supplies. So, of course, this includes some other things besides textbooks, but increasingly the lines are blurring between um, you know, textbooks and other course supplies. Students are increasingly having to buy access codes to get homework systems that they use to turn in their homework and actually can't turn in their homework unless they buy it. Uh, increasingly, they need special software to run um, programs that come with their, their textbooks or special equipment like clickers uh, to use in class. So, uh, you know, this, the, the categories of course materials are expanding, and, and that's exciting, but it also adds a lot of cost burden. And all of this is driven by the rising cost of, of textbooks. And um, just to give you an, an example, of what textbooks cost now. So I know some of you can see that, but for those of you who can't, uh, so this is the, the most popular calculus textbook in, in the US. It's, it's by James Stewart, a guy who um, in, recently was covered in the Wall Street Journal for making um, a gazillion dollars on textbooks and building this you know, huge, lavish house. <laughs> um, and so this is, the, this is the textbook. Anyone who can't see this want to guess how much these books cost? So, yeah, $324.95 for calculus. Calculus, a subject where there hasn't been a major breakthrough in like 300 years. Um, so, of course, pedagogical techniques change, and you know, there's obviously value in this book because so many professors assign it. Uh, but really, $325 for introductory calculus. Uh, that's just crazy in, in today's world. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, there are ways to get access to this book for, for cheaper. There's, you know, a rental option where you can rent it for the semester for $64, um, which, you know, is fine, but you don't get to keep it and you can't mark it up. Um, there's, uh, you can buy a chapter of the book for $15. <laughs> Um, and you can also buy this used on Amazon for like $100 or, or $200, which, you know, it saves money, but it's still a huge burden. Uh, but there's also this. So this is the same book, but the ebook version. And this is what started to happen more frequently as publishers tend to offer. Um, I actually saw a couple of eye rolls as I said ebooks. <laughs> um, so ebook versions of most common textbooks are available from traditional publishers. They're you know, the same layout, the same pagination as the traditional book. They kind of look and feel like a PDF. Uh, and they're a, a available to students, except your options are uh, to, well, this is kind of blurry, but so you can buy it for one semester access, or, or 180 days for $113. Uh, you can buy it for a year for $155. Uh, but when you think about it, calculus is actually a two or three semester course. So if you're buying this, chances are you're still going to need access to this book longer than you're buying access for, which means that you're not actually saving all that much money. Uh, and I find the push toward uh, disappearing ink, 
where, where textbooks just expire um, and students don't have the option to keep them. You know, in, in the digital world, we have the opportunity to actually be able to keep things and store them longer and allow students to keep an entire library with them, you know, on a flash drive instead of, you know, lugging it around. We have that opportunity now, but yet we're, educational materials are becoming harder to keep. And the message that this sends to students, I think, is kind of like this. It's like, you better read your book fast mm -hmm. because there's going to be that like men in black moment where flash, it disappears and you no longer have access to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the message that sends to students, it's like this knowledge is valuable while you're in the course, but it's not valuable enough for you to keep. And that's the wrong message to send to students. And it's not the kind of model that we want to send um, uh, in, in today's world. So some statistics of how this is impacting students. So two out of every three students now say that they have skipped buying a required textbook because the cost is too high. So two out of every three students sitting in the classroom have likely done that in one of those courses, even though the vast majority of the students who said they did this said they thought it could hurt their grade in the course. So they're making decisions that could harm their academic success based on the high cost of textbooks. Um, so one in every three students in a different study said that they, at some point, had earned a, a lower grade because they didn't buy the textbook for their course. Um, and uh, in another study, uh, one in two students said that at some point they've taken fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks, which means they're taking longer to get their degree, uh, which costs them and taxpayers more money. Um, so this... Uh, problem can be solved through uh, this idea of open educational resources. Uh, so this is kind of where we come, um, uh, Spark comes into solving this problem. Uh, as, as Nick was talking about, the, the cost of uh, accessing this information has just grown out of control, but it's not a technology problem. It's not that we don't have the technology to produce and share educational resources at, at a low cost. We do. Um, it's not that we don't have the knowledge within the academy to produce high quality educational resources because the people who write textbooks are already in the academy. So um, it's about taking the current model, which is just broken. Um, you know, students are, are captive consumers. They, they don't get any choice in, in what material they use, which, um, you know, of course, is the way it needs to work because professors uh, are, are the best people to assign, uh, choose what materials to assign in their course. Uh, but it creates the system where prices can just rise out of control and, and there's no check. And open educational resources is the opportunity to take that system back. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means. So open educational resources, we use this uh, formal definition, uh, the Hewlett Foundation definition that uh, OER uh, are teaching, learning, and research resources that either reside in the public domain or released under an intellectual property license that permit their free use and repurposing by others. That's only wonky, but it actually goes back um, and runs pretty much in parallel to the way Nick was talking about open access. Um, that it uh, is, is free plus the right to use the resources. And what's at the root of this is this idea of open education, which is a broader term that you may have heard, um, which is used when we're talking about removing barriers to accessing education. Uh, and you know whether that's removing barriers to actually get into a course or being able to broadcast uh, lectures online to students. Um, or if, if some of you know about MOOCs and the idea of, of being able to open up classes to people all around the world. So this is playing out in a lot of different places, and there are all sorts of barriers that can be removed, legal, technical, um, infrastructural, that, that can help advance open education. And the place that we start and focus on is in resources, because that's um, uh, kind of the foundation of, of where, um, how we share information online. And this term open educational resources or you know, abbreviated OER um, refers to any educational resource. So that's textbooks, slides, software, any, any type of material that can be used for learning um, that is uh, open. And by open we mean free, 
plus the right to reuse. And the way we define reuse rights in the open education space is using the 5R uh, framework. So the 5Rs are there. So first is the right to retain, meaning that you can keep and control a copy forever. Uh, so there's no men in black moment where your book disappears. You can save uh, you know, your entire library of resources you've used on a flash drive forever and nobody can take that away from you. Uh, the right to use mean uh, to use a resource in any context you want, whether that's what it was intended for or not. Like for example, there's a lot of government works that have been published and, and made available online. Um, like for example, HUD publishes uh, some materials for installing uh, like air conditioners and, and regulations um, around building houses that can be repurposed at in career training uh, programs. So the right to reuse it however you want, uh, the right to revise, meaning to take a copy of the resource and actually edit it and change it to make it locally relevant. And this is so key in education because education isn't one size fits all. Every professor has their own way of teaching and the way that their expertise informs the subject. And being able to actually have that level of control over your resources makes you a more effective teacher. So for example, I know that um, you know, one of the math courses I took in college, uh, there are two forms of notation in calculus, uh, Newton and Leibniz. And our book used Newton notation, but my professor kept trying to make us use Leibniz notation. So the right to revise actually gives an instructor the power to switch between those or add examples that are locally relevant. So you know, students can read about um, you know, examples that they've seen in their lives as opposed to something from some other state. Um, the right to remix mean that you can take multiple educational resources and combine them together. So to take chapters from two different open textbooks and, and create a whole new book from that or embed multimedia into text-based resources. And then finally, the right to redistribute, which means uh, to uh, share uh, a copy of the resource in any context you want. Um, so, uh, you know, and without uh, uh, concerns about violating copyright. So, in most cases, these five R's, these reduced rights, are granted with the use of an open license. Uh, either, you know, the resources in the public domain without a copyright, or carries an open license. Creative Commons is the most common form of open licensing. Are most of you familiar with Creative Commons licenses? It's a great set of tools. Um, they have a range of different licenses that span different levels of openness. Um, so uh, generally, um, so the, the kind of more closed versions of Creative Commons licenses uh, allow you to distribute without modifications, either for commercial use or for non-commercial use. We generally don't consider those OER, but really anything that gives you the 5R permissions, including non-commercial licenses, uh, are, are generally considered OER. Um, the Creative Commons Attribution License at the top, which basically says, you have permission to use this resource however you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, so long as you attribute the, the author. And that's kind of the ideal and allows the broadest range of uses, and that's where um, open access is defined, um, uh, the way that Spark defines open access in the Budapest Open Access Initiative. <coughs> But OER can span more broadly, um, although there are, of course, challenges with every additional restriction you add. Uh, so I want to go through, sorry, I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few examples of uh, programs that kind of show what this looks like in practice. So I think many of you have probably heard of MIT's Open Courseware program. Uh, this program launched in the early 2000s uh, out of MIT, where the idea was that they have world-class professors that are creating highly valuable educational resources in their own courses, uh, but only a few thousand students a year get to benefit from those. And they created a program where professors could voluntarily post the materials that they've created online for anybody to access and use under an open license. And uh, this turned out to be hugely successful for MIT. It, it elevated the visibility of the institution and the kind of education they offer. In fact, MIT found that a substantial number of uh, people who came to apply for MIT 
found out about MIT through taking one of these courses. <coughs> and they partnered with other institutions around the world and actually translated a large number of these resources into other languages. So they're being used in other places. And over 150 million people have benefited from these resources. So it's really expanded the impact that MIT has had on the world um, and, and just demonstrated the value of their brand. So there's over 200 institutions across the world that have launched similar programs to this. I think many of you may have seen um, efforts to um, take this even further and open up courses as, as MOOCs that are um, available online where you can actually follow along with the course. Uh, so this is kind of where the idea of open educational resources started, just sort of posting materials that are already being created by faculty. Uh, more recently, there's been a movement toward open textbooks, uh, so creating uh, textbooks that are openly licensed, where you can do the five R's, uh, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, retain. Uh, this project was based here in Texas at Rice University, uh, Open Sex College, uh, one of the largest or, uh, open textbook publishing efforts. Uh, their books are extremely widely used. Actually, there was a study done in, in the, um, the subjects where they have books, which are all high enrollment, you know, intra-level courses, 10% of the faculty, or 10% of the courses in the study uh, were using their books. So 10% market penetration for these books in, in just a couple of years, which is really amazing and, and speaks to the, the quality of these free online open resources. Uh, so this is a, a phenomenal project and a great entry point when you're talking with faculty or if you're a faculty member, take a look at these books. Uh, there's also uh, a project based at the University of Minnesota where they've uh, gone and built a library of uh, open textbooks that have been published by a variety of different sources where you can go and search by subject. And there are actually reviews written of these books by faculty members. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, it's a great way to kind of assess the, the quality and appropriateness of, of textbooks. So this is an excellent resource, open.umn.edu. Uh, and this idea of open textbooks has really helped um, gain visibility in campuses across the country for, for this issue. Um, and the impacts on students have been really incredible. So this is one professor um, at a college in Washington State. He uh, assigned an open textbook in his classes and actually ended up saving students over a million dollars just in his own class by using, using an open textbook. So you know, these are the kind of impacts that, that open textbooks can, can have. Um, you know, just making one small change in, in the book that you're using, using an, an open stack textbook instead of you know, Stuart's calculus like I showed before can save students a huge amount of money. But not only student savings, but there have been a number of studies recently that find that students actually do better when they use open resources. And um, this, this one study was a multi-institutional study uh, where they found that um, in, in virtually all of the courses they studied, students had higher or, or equivalent grades, um, uh, higher completion rates, higher uh, equivalent completion rates. And then one that really stood out is that students actually tended to take a higher credit load the semester after using an open textbook in their course, which means that they're putting the money they saved toward getting their education faster. So, you know, when we look at this in the context of, you know, why students are getting an education, which is to get out and get a job and benefit, benefit our economy and, and be good citizens, you know, reducing the cost of textbooks and using open resources can help advance that agenda. Um, another example, uh, at, at Mercy College in, in New York, um, they implemented open resources in their developmental math uh, program, which I, I probably isn't a, the kind of course that you offer here at Texas Tech, but at community colleges, this is you know, a key gatekeeper course, that if you do not pass this, you cannot get your degree no matter what it is. Um, they used open textbooks and were able to uh, increase the number of students passing with a C or better by 12 percentage points. So that's you know, 12 percentage points, more students who are getting through that course and being able to continue with their education um, so that uh, they're, they're not being held back. And that's simply by changing the materials that professors were using. You know, part of that is definitely just that students are getting access to the book on day one of the course 
and every student starts the course with, with you know, on the same page. But it's also the fact that the professors took the time to, you know, develop locally relevant materials and, and you know, help tailor what they're teaching their students. So it's not, you know, a, a, a frozen TV dinner, but a home-cooked meal, so to speak. Um, and this is just a quote from uh, one of the professors in, involved in that project. And I, I want to give one more illustration of the, the kind of things that are, are possible in the open environment that just aren't possible in the closed environment. So this is an open textbook. Um, it was created for a co course called Project Management for Instructional Designers, uh, which is a, a graduate level course, very you know, high level. There isn't a traditional textbook for this course. You know, the professor would have had to assign you know, four different books you know, to, to, to cover all of the stuff. Uh, but instead, what he did, um, uh, uh, Dr. Wiley, Professor Wiley at Brigham Young University, uh, he took an open textbook in project management, general project management, and assigned as the course to students to actually turn it into project management for instructional designers. So the students, instead of you know writing a bunch of essays that they hate writing, and then he hates grading, and then everybody just throws it away at the end of the semester, they were actually able to contribute to a published work in their field, add their name as a co-author on the book, um, and participate in instructional design, the thing that they were learning, uh, as a product of, of taking the course. So, um, you know, they went in and, you know, replaced examples of, you know, cement procurement with um, open, or like licensed content procurement and, and things like that. And, and um, it's, it's such a cool example, and if, if you read, um, that, that's Dr. Wiley there, I wanted my students to gain hands-on experience managing a project, so I asked my students to engage in a very large-scale revising rights project. So this is the kind of cool stuff that can only happen when you use open materials and when you have those five R use rights. Uh, and this model of, of closed ebooks is just, you know, curtailing all of these exciting new avenues for pedagogy that you know, maybe not every professor wants to explore right now, um, but, but many will in the future and many do right now. So I want to just run through a couple of trends that we're watching in the open education space in terms of what institutions are doing. Uh, one is uh, the idea of an OER degree program. And uh, this is primarily at, at community colleges, but you'll see this a lot on the news. Um, so Tidewater Community College in Virginia was the first one to, to launch a program like this. They replaced uh, all of the traditional textbooks in their two-year business administration degree program uh, with open educational resources that are, that are you know, free for students to use. So they were able to eliminate the cost of textbooks, allow students to graduate without spending a single dollar on textbooks. Uh, and what they found is that more students are, are getting to these courses, fewer are withdrawing, um, fewer are dropping out. And uh, you know there are examples of students who are saying, you know, I, I was able to, um, uh, you know, put braces on my daughter because I saved money on textbooks. Um, at the community college level, this can have just a real impact on people's lives. And at the four-year level, this is playing out in looking at the um, the core curriculum. So I was talking about OpenStax; they publish books for most of the high-level or lower-level introductory courses. You know, could you replace? all of your core courses with OER and help freshman students save, um, you know, $500 a year. Um, so this is a trend we're watching recently. Uh, 38 community colleges announced that they were uh, going to create programs like this uh, through an initiative by Achieving the Dream. And, and the event I was at yesterday uh, with, with uh, Second Lady Biden uh, in California was about America's College Promise, which is an effort to make college free, that uh, 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 Dr. Biden will be helping to lead uh, after the administration ends in January. And uh, this idea of textbook costs needs to be part of that conversation. Um, and this idea of, of really taking an institutional approach and, and programmatic approach fits in very nicely with that. Um, there's also a lot happening on the policy level. So Nick talked about uh, federal policy in terms of open licensing 
of, uh, or sorry, public access to federally funded research uh, legislation and uh, uh, executive directives. There's a similar effort happening on the open education side. So it started with this grant program, which has possibly one of the most ridiculous acronyms that has ever been invented. Um, so the TAA CCCT program, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grants program, through the Department of Labor, uh, was $2 billion investment in improving workforce training programs to help people who, uh, whose job, who lost their jobs due to trade uh, to learn new skills and get employed. And they invested $2 billion in this program and attached a requirement that said that when you develop resources that improve workforce training programs, you need to put an open license on those resources and share them with the world. So that when we invest in develop, when we as the public, taxpayers, invest in the development of these resources, they can benefit the public <laughs> and every other community college in the country um, can uh, uh, use them too. So this idea has expanded. Uh, the Department of Labor has since adopted an agency-wide policy to do this with, with all of their grants. And currently, uh, the Department of Education has a, a policy, uh, open licensing policy for all of their discretionary grants under review by the White House that we're expecting um, to move forward as, as soon as in the next in the next month. Uh, so this is going to help advance conversations on campuses if you know you're getting grants from the Department of Education uh, research grants or, or any um, Department of Education related grants there will be an open licensing requirement attached to the resources if this policy is successful and I think that is going to help promote conversation on campus about the importance of doing this and how to do it uh, and I think there's a really important role there for libraries to play in supporting that um, and uh, just at the K-12 level, the, the Department of Love Education has been working to promote uh, K-12 schools and states to make commitments to OER. And while that's obviously not directly related to higher ed, um, you know, you all have K-12 schools in your communities. And there is an opportunity here to partner and, and you know, especially connecting with, with K-12 libraries. And you know, if you do have OER programs on campus, helping to exchange information and, and provide support. So uh, we want to transition now into what you can do to put open into action on campus. Uh, so on, on the open education front, I think the you know the biggest thing is to oh sorry go ahead. What well, um, there's a, a player you haven't mentioned on the textbook side. And I, um, in my field, I, we have accrediting agencies or accrediting bodies, mm -hmm. and some faculty feel pressure from those accrediting bodies, especially at the graduate level, to use certain textbooks. Um, is there a, a conversation going on with accrediting bodies either for eventual licensing? I, I'm not actually thinking of things like SACS, which is our accrediting agency for the university, but professional I'm thinking, thinking things like ABET for engineering, the American Psychological Association for clinical and counseling psychology, educational psychology, um, where there is where they look at the course design mm -hmm. and faculty are, are concerned that they are going to not that course isn't going to make the accrediting team. Certainly, there. Um, you know, it, it it certainly depends on, on a different type of course. I think that isn't as relevant at the undergraduate level. Uh, but sure, at the, at the graduate level, there may be perceived concerns. There's certainly not course. I'm thinking about calculus. ABET's going to look at how you teach your calculus course. So there aren't specific textbooks that are approved and not approved, okay. and it's a absolute utter violation of academic freedom to suggest a professor has to choose one of the textbooks um, that, that would be approved by the accrediting body. They should choose a textbook that is going to meet their course objectives and how they want to teach the course. Your question was about <coughs> anxiety well, over that. And how, how the, the spark is, mm -hmm. are there any act, activities to educate 
the accreditors? So no, not at the moment. That process is very opaque. And it is one where it is difficult for even institutions to engage in those conversations. Uh, it's definitely something that is worth exploring. Uh, I, I think, yet, there is so much project progress that can be made uh, by starting with the faculty who want to make a change. And I, I think, you know, anytime you're talking about theory of change, you, you got to start with the, the low hanging fruit. And there's so much progress that can be made there. And you know, definitely there's a lot of frontiers that we, we need to cover, and we will cover a few um, in, in our remaining slides. But um, you know, start with the low-hanging fruit, and all fruit falls eventually. <laughs> um, a great quote by um, a librarian I work with called West. So moving forward into just kind of what you can do. So the, the biggest thing that people can do um, is to consider using open educational resources where you can. Uh, and this is a role where uh, libraries have been really instrumental in helping. Um, just point of UMass Amherst, uh, uh, they have popularized a model uh, where they provide many grants to faculty members to research open educational resources that they can use in their course um, and actually replace their expensive traditional materials with open um, and where open is an available library licensed resources. And this program has generated an enormous return on investment. They've saved students over a million dollars just just through investing, you know, a thousand dollars or so in, in getting a faculty member to just take a step to replace the textbooks in one course. Um, and you know, libraries are obviously well positioned to be able to help faculty find resources that, that can help suit their courses. So this kind of model has been really, really successful, either as a you know a dedicated program or just working one-on-one -on -one with faculty. Uh, there's also a program called the uh, Open Textbook Network that's coming to campuses and, and does professional development workshops with faculty. Um, and they've been very successful at, at, at helping um, faculty adopt open textbooks specifically. And uh, uh, again, going back to this idea of, of just starting where you can and taking steps where you can. If we were to just replace one textbook per student per year with OER, it would save students $1.42 billion in the US. Another thing that, that you can do um, and, and talk to faculty about doing is just making your own work open that you can. So uh, whether that's doing something like an open courseware program like MIT did where you know, you're opening up your institutional repository to allow faculty to archive resources that they've created uh, or just encouraging faculty to apply open licenses to the work that they've done. Um, and this can actually end up really benefiting authors. Uh, these are two authors of a statistics textbook. Um, uh, uh, they, this textbook was originally published by a traditional publisher, but they actually turned it into an open textbook. They got the copyright back, they improved it, revised it, it released a new edition. Uh, before it was really used by a couple of thousand students a year, now it is, it's used by millions of people. And it's literally transformed um, the, the one on the left, or. Yeah, your left, uh, Barbara Olowski, it's, it's transformed her career. Like her visibility in, in her field uh, has, and she's won an award from the Academic Text and Academic Authors Association, so there are you know, huge opportunities for authors in this space as well. Um, so moving into open access, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nick to talk about what you can do there. Almost done. Uh, <clears throat> So on the open access side of things, uh, first is uh, use the institutional repository, uh, make the articles that you've already published uh, freely accessible and read the citation advantage that I was talking about um, at the uh, beginning of the presentation. Um, so I think that's probably the, the, the I can say the easiest, but certainly the most actionable uh, step is going back uh, to the slide earlier about you know, more than 70% of publishers will allow some form of the article to be made uh, accessible. Uh, next thing is to consider formalizing that into an actual institutional policy, uh, which you know something that goes through the faculty senate is usually um, you know, usually a multi-year process to raise awareness and uh, uh, 
sort of clear up misconceptions. But as I said, uh, getting I think it's a really powerful way um, to sort of collectively retain rights to the intellectual output of the university, so that you know faculty have more rights to do you know with their work, um, you know what they what they want to share publicly. Uh, increasingly, institutions are also putting together uh, what are called campus open access funds to cover article processing charges that some open access journals uh, charge to make uh, articles openly available. Um, you know, increasingly, research funders like the NIH are covering those charges, or the Gates Foundation, are covering those charges on behalf of researchers they fund. Um, you know, but that's only a you know portion of researchers have uh, you know funding from large you know federal agencies. Uh, or private foundations that have these policies in place. And so these campus open access funds uh, sort of close the gap uh, to provide funding to publish in, uh, like I said, the subset of, of some open access journals that charge article processing uh, charges. Uh, if you participate in uh, the editorial board of a journal, uh, there's an increasing trend. It's actually been happening for a long time, but it has picked up momentum. Uh, of entire editorial boards of subscription-based journals resigning en masse in protest over their access policies and essentially starting the same journal uh, but uh, with a different name uh, you know, that, that's open access. So the most recent high-profile example uh, of this was a journal uh, called Lingua uh, that was and continues to be published by Elsevier uh, and the editorial board uh, you know, did not like how difficult it was to get access to the articles that, that uh, Lingua published and after negotiations with Elsevier broke down, uh, they decided essentially to start a new journal with the same editorial board, essentially trying to pick up where Lingua uh, left off, but uh, called Glossa. Um, and so and I think this is a really good example of how researchers and the academy really have the power. Uh, you just actually have to exercise it. Um, you know, since this has happened, you know, the Glossa editorial board has done a big communications push um, to sort of make it known what has happened. You know, as you can see in the article inside Higher Ed, it got, you know, a decent amount of visibility. Um, you know, and now there seems to be sort of a, now a fairly negative connotation around the old journal um, and a lot of the reputation because of the editorial board having moved sort of together um, is sort of now part of uh, Glossa, even though Lingua continues to exist, though. Uh, some have actually called it a zombie journal. Uh, but there, there are other examples uh, of this happening, and I think it's a powerful uh, way that you know researchers can exercise you know the power that, that you have when you're serving on these editorial boards, often for free. Uh, the other thing that might be uh, a little bit more controversial, uh, but I don't think actually is, is actually trying to bake open uh, into the promotion and tenure process. And this is by no means uh, to create any kind of requirement at all. Uh, it's not that um, when we're talking to particularly tenure track faculty uh, on campuses, a lot of times you know they'll say, "I'm very sympathetic. I really want to make my work open, but I'm scared. I'm worried about what my tenure committee is going to say if I publish this, um, you know, in PLOS One rather than um, you know X journal in my discipline um, that has a good reputation." And one of the the ways that sort of hit on to try to get around this is just putting language in promotion and tenure guidelines um, that say that the university values um, wide distribution of um, you know, the results of research that happens on campus, um, that it supports making articles openly available either through an institutional repository and an open access journal that supports and values making the data that underlies research articles uh, openly available or even um, you know, sharing educational materials that, that faculty Create. Um, you know, this isn't a mandate at all. Uh, you know, it's not something that you're going to sort of get points deducted. Um, you know, if you don't follow. But in our conversations with tenure track faculty, and you can definitely tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, what we the feedback we've gotten is to just having language like this would at least make them feel more comfortable that the institution sort of understands their decision to publish in an open access journal and will um, sort of value that rather than saying, you know, why didn't you publish in like what. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, Spark uh, has, for a, about a decade now, really uh, placed uh, sort of a heavy value on working with students and sort of the next generation of researchers and librarians and policymakers and authors. Um, and one of the most exciting initiatives that we've launched recently is called OpenCon, which is uh, a conference specifically for uh, sort of the next generation 
uh, of you know, you know uh, researchers, librarians, uh, you know, sort of all types of folks across the academy that sort of touch research or academia in one, one sense or another um, that are interested or already sort of pushing for open access to research articles, open data, uh, and open educational resources. Um, and so we will have the third OpenCon uh, this year, November 12th to the 14th, in Washington, D.C. Um, and the response that we've gotten uh, from sort of uh, students and early career researchers and early career librarians has been, uh, it's been overwhelming, uh, frankly. When we started OpenCon for the, the first time in 2014, um, we got more than uh, 100 or 1,700 applications from about 125 countries. Um, which we were blown away by. Uh, and now, uh, just two years later, uh, in this cycle, we actually received more than 10,000 applications from 176 countries, um, which I think really shows the magnitude of interest in these issues from the next generation um, you know, across, uh, across the world. Um, the other thing is that uh, because it's uh, you know, an in-person meeting that's, that's fairly small, uh, largely because we actually try to financially support the full or partial travel costs for most of the participants, since you know students and early career folks typically have fairly a difficult time getting access to travel funded. Um, we try to partner with organizations in the community to cover um, those costs for you know as many of the participants as possible. Um, but knowing that in-person meetings don't scale well, um, we live webcast the entirety uh, of the event and have uh, about 2,000 folks RSVP for that. We would invite you know all of you. Uh, to join us. Um, and we also have an open call for uh, partners to host satellite events. And so uh, around last year, we had about 30 satellite events around the world that have reached about 1,500 people uh, that mixed you know, content from the recorded content from the main meeting with local you know, panels and keynote you know, presentations to sort of localize the discussion on these issues uh, you know, in a region or a particular campus. Um, you know, so we've seen uh, universities and you know, a couple of universities in a given area collaborate to have an event. But if this is something that's uh, of interest and you have some traction with, you know, early career faculty and students uh, hosting a satellite event is uh, another way you might consider uh, you know, sort of advancing the conversation here. Uh, so with that, this is our contact information. Um, you know, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop us an email or, you know, uh, want the citations for some of the data that we mentioned in the talk. We're happy to, uh, to share that. And I think, I think we have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions, though, if anybody needs to, to head out early, I totally understand. Um, so any any questions for either myself or Nicole? You said all of this is already online at the site, the, the thing you listened to at the beginning? Yeah, let's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we use a lot of slides, so let's just... Let's It is case sensitive, but this is all lowercase. Okay, and if, as you need, if you didn't sign in when you came in, could you please sign when you leave? Awesome, thank you so much.